first chapter anyway. Right. Um, any questions from homework that maybe some of you have started doing? <coughs> yes, questions, or, or are you just saying, yes, I've started doing homework? Good. So no questions yet. What's that? Probably next week. Next week, okay. All right. Okay. Um, because I'm really not going to focus a lot on chapter one in lecture. Um, I'll really quickly talk about a few things. Um, I'm not even going to really write a lot down. Uh, this is really dependent on you going in there and reading and getting the definitions down. Um, the first set of homework from chapter one is not difficult. It's just definitions. It's not going to say define this word. It's going to say, you know, can you use the terminology? What type of thing is this? Um, so remember last time we started talking about, um, and I was trying to give us a, 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 a situation to kind of work with the definitions. Because the definitions by themselves, not the most exciting things in the world, but statistics is all about trying to say something about some group of things or people, right? So what's that group of things or people that's known as that I want to discuss? Population. The whole population. Cool. And we often think of populations being very large. A population could be this row. You guys could be a population, right? Uh, so it doesn't have to be huge. But normally, if it is large, we don't work with the whole population. We work with a sample. sample cool. <coughs> and then we ask questions, which is related to the variable. Right? And the answers to those questions would then be the data. 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 I like it. Whichever way you want to say it. One is plural, one isn't. I can't remember. Um, what type of data you can collect is interesting. And there are several words describing the different types of data. Because, for example, um, I don't know if this is ever really interesting, but a while back they did a study and found out that the average color of the universe is beige, which kind of sounds lame, but at the same time, does that make sense to take an average color? Not really. I mean, what they did was they looked at the wavelength of light, but still, does it really tell you anything? For example, can I take an average color of hair in the classroom? Does, it, does that make any sense? What is brown plus blonde plus bald <laughs> divided by three? I have no idea, right? Um, so that must mean that brown, bald, that, that's, you know, hair color, light color, whatever, all those things, you know, color is one example, some other examples are, must be one level of data, whereas ages, we were talking about last uh, time, ages, they must be some other level of data because you can do more with ages, right? So uh, colors and, and types of car and name of your shoes and so forth, those are all called nominal data. And there's four levels of data. There's nominal. Who knows the second one? Let me see who's read so far. Read. I like it. There's nominal, ordinal, interval, ratio. I love it. These two are normally considered what's uh, uh, quantitative. But that's not a hard, fast rule, okay? This is not hard, fast. But what does quantitative mean versus qualitative? Able to be counted. Good. The root word of quantitative seems to be quantity, which means there must be some uh, amount of something, right? So these are what I call truly numerical data. Whereas qualitative, they have a quality as a characteristic. <laughs> So that's obviously not numerical. Where would, um, so nominal is, is like names. The root word there is nom, like plume de nom. You guys know the, the phrase plume de nom? Pen name. So like Stephen King, when he first started writing, it was Richard Bachman. That's back when he could really write well. Oh, wow. Well, the last few books are okay. Nominal is like uh, just names. They can be categorized. And that's all they can be that can be done with them. If you add on top of that some inherent <coughs> order, that would be ordinal. So something is not, um, ordinal obviously would be like first place, second place, third place in a race. So it's still a name. I could say, you're the second place guy. I remember you, you came in second place. 
That could be your name. But it's also got some inherent order, obviously. Something else is not very obvious for ordinal is when you go to a restaurant, sometimes what's sitting on the table? I like it. Cool. She's like, I don't know what you want. This isn't really the shape of pepper, but I'm with you. On, uh, that's something that you would do at the end after you've eaten and so forth. Have you ever been to one of these restaurants where they have a little, how did we do, rate our, oh. right? I like that though. It's good. It's a big old giant packet of peppers. <laughs> so if I put down, if I made one of those and it said rate my performance today as a teacher and I wrote down, um, and I wrote down, was I good? Was I poor? Was I, um, did I do a fair job? Was it excellent? What's kind of wrong with the way I've written that? It's out of order. So they are just words, but there's an inherent order to them because of the variable they answer. Rate my performance, right? So there's an order to them. So this would be an example of ordinal data. How would we do it so far? Another place would be like strongly disagree, disagree, agree. Uh, I missed neutral, <laughs> of course now I'm already doing them out of work. Agree, strongly agree. Right? That has to have a certain order to it, or else people are going to say, you're trying to mislead me. I'm from Florida, I can't handle things that aren't in good order. There's some older people, or historical buffs. Okay, good old 2000, it was an awesome time. Um, so those four levels, uh, these two levels are just purely um, co considered qualitative for the most part. Interval and ratio definitely have to be numerical because they involve being able to do math with them. Interval, who knows what operation you can do with the data to be considered interval data. If anybody's read, I like it. subtraction. Can be performed and the answer makes sense. So, for example, zip codes. Could you subtract two zip codes? Yes. Would the answer make sense? No. Wouldn't tell you anything, right? Oh, I'm 10 more than your zip code. I'm better. Doesn't mean anything. So it wouldn't be interval data. Where would zip codes go? Ordinal. And why do you say ordinal? It's not quite ordinal because, yeah, it would be nominal. They do have a certain way of assigning zip codes. But it doesn't really go bam, 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 right? So I could see an argument one way or the other. I would put it in nominal personally, but if you said ordinal, I'd understand. That's the other thing about this I want to tell you. Whenever you do a quiz or a test, and it's a problem that says identify which level of data, I always ask you and explain your answer. Because very often, the way that you look at a situation changes what level you think of it as. So if you explain your reasoning, I'll be OK sometimes. I have a thing that I'm looking for, but then I'm like, oh, yeah, it could be looked at as that. Um, how are we doing so far? Now, something else that's interval data would be um, year of birth. Oh, oh. <laughs> Give me just one second. Um, why would this be interval data? If you were born, when were you born? 1986. 86, and I was born in 1972. So the difference in those two dates, those two years, does it mean something? Yes. What does it represent? The difference in our ages. Okay, the difference how much older I am than you are, right? So when I subtract two years, <coughs> it makes sense. Ratio would be all about division. Why would year of birth not be ratio data then? When it, could I divide 1986 by 1972? Sure. Would I get an answer? Of course I would. Does it actually physically mean something? No. no. So that's one quick way to tell the difference. So let me, let me take a break right there. Uh, two guys in the back are from the Mass Study Center. They're tutors there. They're going to talk about <coughs> tutoring opportunities for a few minutes. Should I get in front of the camera? Yeah, do it. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Josh, and this is Gabriel. We're from the Mass Study Center. We've both been working there for about two years now. And at the Mass Study Center, you can get free tutoring help. That's on campus. 
free tutoring. Now, it'd be great if everyone would take advantage of this. Um, in our little brochure that's getting passed out right now, it says in the back, students that attend the Mass Study Center on average earn a grade about 20% higher than they would have normally without attending the Mass Study Center. So think about that. If you're a C student, what does that mean? When this is a math class. You're an A student. Now, that's awesome, right? We can help you get through this. Um, right now, this is all definitions. It's kind of slow. I promise this is going to pick up and get a bit more interesting. Um, now, whenever you come into the Math Study Center, we ask that you log in so we can keep track of who's there and when we need to staff tutors. Normally, there's two to six tutors on staff, and they can help you with whatever your math needs are. Uh, with statistics, though, there's only a select number of tutors that can help you out. If you walk in there, you're going to see a schedule <coughs> on the wall. Check that out. There's going to be names in blue. Those names in blue are the ones that can help with statistics. So find out whenever statistics tutors are working, and please come on in. Now, we have a five-minute rule, but some stats questions take a bit longer than that. If you come in during from 10 to 3, you're... I can't like we, I can't shake out of that five minute rule that we have. I'm gonna have to follow that, and I'll push you in the right direction, and I'll move on. If you come on bef if you come in before ten, and <coughs> if you come in before ten, and then after three, I can work with that a little bit. I can round up um, and give you a little bit more help than than I would be able to normally during the peak hours. We're open Monday through Thursday, from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. So we come in early and we stay late, and then on Fridays we're here from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. So that's just kind of a average day banker's hours kind of thing. <laughs> so, but most people don't have classes on Fridays. So, yeah, you got to drive up here, but you can sit in there and get math help all day long. Now, if you don't like anything that I just said, where, oh my, he's only going to be able to help me for five minutes. He's going to leave me as soon as you know we get to the good part of the problem. You can uh, schedule tutoring for two hours a week, one on one upstairs in the tech mall. So you're going to go into the tech mall, up the spiral staircase, and look off to your left side. There's going to be Lucy Price's office. Her office just moved. It's uh, where the assessment center used to be. So you go in there and you can schedule tutoring. That's not just for math. That's for any subject that you're taking. Now, if you guys don't have uh, math books or your calculator, you, we, there's also stuff you can do to rent them. Not really rent, but check them out from us. You can check them out from us. We just need a driver's license, military ID, or passport. Uh, but whenever you're using it, you have to stay in the Mass Study Center. And we're no, no longer allowing people to make copies or anything of the pages. We got in trouble for that. <laughs> um, now, if you don't like that, in the library, you can check out a calculator for a whole week. And you can take it wherever you want. You just got to bring it back, of course, so they're going to charge you. And then you can check out a book for three or four hours. I can't remember which one that is. Uh, we have some workshops coming up. There's going to be schedule posted in the Mass Study Center. And so if you want a review of <laughs> fractions, radicals, word problems, um, factoring, which you might not need a whole lot of that here, but you can go to these workshops and for about an hour you just you'll attend a, a lecture outside of class and get refreshed on that information. Josh, at least set dates for the TI. The Not yet. I just, okay. I'm going to be doing a calculator workshop, but I haven't set the date yet. Okay. I've got to look at my schedule. No Are there any questions? Is Amanda going to be tutoring this semester? She is not. Oh, she, in the summer. <laughs> yeah, she'll be back in the summer if any of you know who Amanda is. Anything else? All right, thank you. Cool. Thanks, guys. It's good to see all of you. I used to coordinate the Mass Study Center, and now Sean Hicks does that. If anybody knows Sean Hicks, he's now in charge. Uh, so he should be sending emails out and information about workshops. I'll let you guys know, obviously, about stats workshops. I'll probably be doing a few of them. And the TI workshop, we're going to be using the graphing calculator a lot in here. So if you've never used it before, you probably want to go to like an intro basic. They won't even talk about stat stuff, just how the hell do you do basic stuff in the calculator just to get you started. Um, next week we'll be doing some calculator stuff, so I desperately need anybody, if you can, you must get that calculator by next week. I'll bring a few with me, but you want to have your own uh, for this semester. Cool. So any other questions about what they were talking about?
we're actually going to take a little field trip at the end of class. And since they've already come in and talked, we'll just kind of go by the Mass City Center, but we'll also visit upstairs and show. I'll show you where the um, upstairs tutoring center is, and then I'll show you where my office is so everybody knows that now. Okay, cool. Um, coming back to this real quick. One reason why ratios division makes sense is because another thing that ratios have is a true zero. So zero means what it's supposed to mean. Now what the hell does that mean? What's uh, if I was born in the year zero? The fact that I'm talking to you now would be strange, but does that is the, the zero really mean what it's supposed to mean there? The years kind of track how much time I've kind of kept track of. Zero, if it meant what it's supposed to mean, should be this is the beginning of time. So the people that were around before the year zero might have some exception to that, right? Wait a minute. We're here. Time passed. So <laughs> zero is not the right place. Do you guys with me? So what about temperature? How many temperature scales do you guys know? Some of us know three. Most of us know at least temp, uh, uh, Fahrenheit, Celsius, right? And the third one is the one that you learn in chemistry, physics, Kelvin. Kelvin. Kelvin is the only one that zero means the absence of what it measures, which I'll say is heat. It's actually kinetic energy, but we'll say heat, right? Zero degrees Celsius, zero degrees Fahrenheit. Can it get colder? <coughs> yes. So what level of data is Celsius or Fahrenheit temperature? Interval, because you can say it's uh, two degrees warmer today than it was yesterday. But is 80 degrees twice as hot as 40 or something? I mean, what's twice as hot as 60 degrees? I would say about. I would say that makes sense for 80. I mean, it's kind of subjective at that point, right? I can't say officially because what would be zero at uh, twice as hot as zero degrees? Not zero. That, you know, twice zero is zero, but that doesn't make any sense. You guys kind of with me on this. So those kind of problems really should not be evil. And in fact, in the book, they give you kind of uh, guidelines as to how to tell on page 15 at the bottom. They kind of tell you how to tell the difference between them. All right. So I will let you guys read through that. I do want to talk a little bit about 1.4. Give you a couple of examples. Um, <coughs> one four is really all about. Part of it is sort of like the thing I talked about the other day about. Oh, playing basketball makes you taller, right? Misunderstanding what uh, observations you see. You know, the correlation there is kind of backwards in that case. The one about cell phone towers and babies, it wasn't backwards. It was just oh, there's a whole third thing I didn't think about, right? Um, so for example. Just give me one example out of the homework. Um, can you give me a better alternate conclusion <coughs> based on a study showing that college graduates tend to live longer than those who don't graduate from college? A researcher concludes that studying causes people to live longer. That's sort of like the dude that thought playing basketball causes you to be taller, but not quite. What's a better conclusion? So college graduates tend to live longer than those who do not attend college. Does that mean that all that extra studying adds years in your life? I would argue it might subtract a little with the stress. But <laughs> what's really going on then? College, college graduates have wealth, so they can afford better health care. All right. If you graduate college, you probably get a better job. You have more money, so you can afford better health care. Um, college graduates are usually going to jobs that you. OK, good. This is true. College graduates then have access to jobs that don't require necessarily as much possible personal physical harm, yeah. right? Yes? All right, that's, a, that's actually a good point. Um, a lot of times correlations happen because um, the, the one I really hate, and you bring up a good point, is it says people who live, you know, so here's a really stupid example, is people who live to be age 60 have a higher chance of living to be 100. Well, that's freaking stupid. Now, isn't that, on the face of it, you can tell that's dumb, right? But this happens all the time. Let me give you a real quick example. It has been discovered that students who reach 
a transfer level course like 160 have a higher chance of transferring to another college and getting a degree there. Now, on the heels of what I just said, you guys kind of know what to look for. So right there, what would you say about that? If I wanted to do something, for example, and this is, I'm personally bitter about this because this is true. If I wanted to have a program where students can bypass algebra and go straight to statistics because I thought, oh, then they'll have a better chance of making it through college because did I misinterpret the correlation? Yeah. Hell yes. What's really going on? Well, if you make it to transfer level, you know, like statistics, that means you've made it through the math. You made it through the math, you're going to do a lot better than the other courses that need that math, right? So of course you're going to have a higher chance. If you don't make it there, you didn't make it there. You probably dropped out or went somewhere else or who knows? Okay, so you see there's a misapplications of that. So I'm glad you said that. I didn't even think about that for this problem. It's perfect. Cool. So one thing I want you to realize right there, there's not exactly one correct answer for these. There are a lot of different ways to look at these problems. Um, okay, so that's one little section of this homework, section 1-4. Um, what do you think about this here? Oh, that one's just... <laughs> that was a little bit overweighted. Uh, how about this? The Internet Service Provider America Online. Yes, they're still out. <laughs> Ran a survey of its users and asked if they preferred a real Christmas tree or a fake one. They received this many responses. They found out that 66% want a real tree. So does that mean that 66% of Americans want a real tree? Yeah. No. What's uh, inherently wrong with the way they collected their sample? The question here really is, use critical thinking to address the key <coughs> issue. So one answer to these is, how did they collect their sample? Did they good, do a good job of collecting their sample? No. Why was it a bad job? Yeah, how many AOL users do I have in this? Not surprisingly, <laughs> not that many. It's okay to do it. It's fine. I don't. But it's yes. But uh, we, you're not going to see a lot of AOL users anymore nowadays, right? But even beyond that, I don't care what you use. You're being. Why is it not a good sample? Voluntary response. All right. Something I have that hasn't come up yet, voluntary response. So when I send something out, if I send out a letter and I say, please respond to me and then I'll use that data, why would that be bad possibly? Only opinionated people. So it might leave some people out, right? But more important issue. People are lazy and they don't take the initiative to get up and go and send it back. Now realize this, people will send it back, right? What is it about those people that send it back? Yes, they're opinionated. They're highly opinionated. And very often, you're highly opinionated more in one direction or the other direction. So what's that going to do to your results? Skew it. Skew them. So this is why I hate uh, when, when CNN or Fox or MSNBC or whatever they put up, we just asked this question, and here's the result. How good, what do those results mean? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Not shit. They don't mean anything. So don't even look at that stuff. Results from the newspaper really don't mean anything because opinionated people plus not as many people get newspapers nowadays. Right? Yeah. Oh God. I plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> Unbiased nowadays is really difficult to get. And we won't get into the whole issue of who pulled things in what direction first. We won't go there. Um, it's really difficult. Uh, I'd have to say Daily Show, actually. <laughs> Anybody watch The Daily Show? Yeah. Yes? That, unfortunately, I love Jon Stewart. Jon Stewart is really smart. He actually killed the show Crossfire. If you, you should search Jon Stewart Crossfire interview. If you have never seen it, you should see it. It is hilariously awesome. Crossfire was a bullshit show. He went on there, told them that, and then they were gone a few weeks after. That it was awesome. Uh, anyway, sorry, sorry. So those of you who don't know The Daily Show, it's a comedy show, but unfortunately nowadays it's almost the best place to get some straight news. He's got really high-ranking people on the show. I'd still say watch the news. You just have to watch it with a careful eye as to, you know, what, why do they pick this? Why, what are they saying about it? What tone are they using? Who are they interviewing? That kind of thing. Um, okay. So I think you guys, you guys get the feel for that. So section one four, it's really just 
you know, either what's the better way to think about this data, why was the researcher crazy, and the other part is what did they do wrong and how they collected their data, right? Uh, one five gets into more specific ways to collect data. Um, and let me see if I can do this pretty quickly, because again, this is really based on your reading the book. Um, we talked a little bit the other day about the best way to pick data. So we, we uh, I said, we ended up saying basically if we can get like a, either, I think the dude that was saying a random generated um, numbers, was that, that was you, yeah. I think you were there the other day, so now I got to follow. Um, I was saying put the whole thing up on there, put all the students' names, have different people throw darts up there, blindfolded or something, and just run out of the room and let them go. Um, that is what our attempt to get what's called a random sample, a truly random sample. So why would like an American Online survey or calling people on the phone or anything like that, why would that not truly be a random sample? It's a very simple question. Somebody actually said this earlier. Yeah. Let's say that, um, well, those are voluntary, you're right. But let's say that um, I'm calling people up by picking their phone number and they, they and I'm recording, do they respond to me or not? That's the, so it's not voluntary then, right? So it's not, I'm trying to eliminate that. What's the big deal with that though? You're leaving some people out. <laughs> Right? And that's sort of like what you were saying in a way, but I wanted to get from the other direction. You're leaving some people out. So what then is the goal for a really good, truly random sample? What should be true for each person or thing in the population? What should be true if I'm trying to take a really good sample? Each thing should... Get in each person. Well, it shouldn't be included because then I wouldn't be taking a sample. I'd be looking at the whole population, which is a problem. Too many things. Each thing should have a equal chance to get into the sample. That's the definition of random sample. Every item or person or whatever in the population has an equal chance of getting into your sample. As long as you do that, any data analysis is then uh, could then be trusted as long as you know your math. Yeah. How would I say it? Like you're saying, you're full of people from a phone, but you're not saying that everybody has a phone, so how would you get people answering that? Really? Good. So phone surveys inherently have a problem. <coughs> so Gallup very often does phone surveys. Uh, and they add, there's one <coughs> part of the website where they talk about the fact that phone surveys are not perfect, but there a lot of people have phones nowadays, so you're not leaving out too many. So any any issue critical to those who don't have phones They'd have to find some other way to make sure that they're included, right? Um, why is random sample one of the hardest things to actually totally achieve? Because of that. How do you get in touch with people? How do you get them to respond? How All this kind of stuff. It's really difficult. So when you're doing an actual survey, when you do an actual statistical analysis, you do the best you can. And you show that you do the best you can, and then you go with the data. But do you start to see how why people really don't trust statistics? Because no matter what you do, you can never might quite make it perfect. And even if you make a perfect random sample, I figured out how to get a hold of those guys, right? I figured out how to get a hold of everybody. Is it impossible, for example, if I'm doing age, is it impossible for me to pick a bunch of the really oldest people at random? No, it's not impossible. It's possible. <coughs> do you guys kind of with me here? Yeah. So, um, Random sample is the objective, but it's really hard to truly get a random sample. So random sample, every element in the population has a chance to get in, the same chance. There is something called a uh, simple random. So let me ask you this. If I if I pick one person at random from each row, right? Like from each row, 
I just give you all a number and pick it out of a hat. Would that be random? Sample. No. Who am I leaving out? Who does not have an equal chance to be included? If my population is everybody who's here right now. If my population is everybody in this room right now, and I take one person from each row, does everybody have an equal chance to be in the sample? The rows are different That's okay. Doesn't matter. Yes, ex excluding me, or I'll sit down somewhere, right? Are you guys with me? Everybody then has an equal chance to be in the sample. How, how are we doing so far? So that would be random. Simple random says every subgroup of the population has to have an equal chance to be selected. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Let me see if I can make this clear. If I take one person from each row, does the subgroup of these people, the first row people over here, or you guys would be the first row, I don't know, ace, high, low, I don't know. These people right here, do they have an equal chance? Does this group have a chance to be in the sample together? Does this group have a chance to be in the sample? Why not? Because I'm only taking one person from each row. So would that process of selecting people be a simple random process? No. No. Good. Because not every group has an equal chance to be in there. This is going to become a lot more important once we get to chapter 7, which is really where, where we focus on groups instead of individuals. So that's why I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, because there's still a lot of you out there going, <coughs> I have no idea. <laughs> and I understand. So if I take one person from each row randomly, that is simple. I mean, not simple, sorry. That is random. That is random because each person then has a chance to be in the sample. If I take, if I do that, it's not simple random because a group, there is a group, at least one group, that can't be in the sample. Okay, maybe. Thank you. Um, make sure I'm going the right way. Uh, systematic sampling is exactly what it sounds like. It's where I could start, I have a random starting place, and then I start taking like every third person. That's systematic. That's awesome. It's an easy one to remember, right? Systematic, every fifth car that goes by. Every five minutes I go out and take the temperature. There's some system to how I collect the data. Cool, cool. Um, the next two are the ones that are really difficult to tell the difference between. Um, it's uh, stratified and cluster. Of course, being a watcher of The Daily Show, <laughs> my brain goes somewhere when I say this. Well, it's not good. Stratified and cluster, those are two different ways of collecting sample uh, elements right, from the population. They both have the same first step, and that's why they kind of get confused. They both say break population into groups. So I actually already did this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's nine rows in here. Oh, why does this room have to be so big? I lost track. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, good. So they both say break the population up into groups. Let me just represent a few there. Stratified says, take some or at least one from each group. Maybe some from some, right? Take some, at least one from each group, and all these then go into my sample. How are we doing? That's exactly what I did earlier, right? One from each one. That's my sample. That's stratified. How are we doing? Maybe, maybe. So it is random. It is a random process, but more specifically, it's got a specific method. It's stratified. Cluster would say, take an entire row randomly. Right? Take a few rows randomly. So I leave entire rows out and include other entire rows. Right? So I would just randomly you and this row and that row. And then every student in those rows is my sample. <coughs> Question. Yeah. 
People get hooked up on this. They say that can't be random because then these guys have no chance to be in the sample because they didn't include them. And I'm like, they had a chance. Everybody has a chance until I pick. So you can't go after the fact, well, you didn't include it. No, he had a chance. He just didn't make it in. It's too bad. Yeah. Yeah, in your clusters, your samples will be considered subgroups. Uh, the the sample is made up of yes. entire subgroups. Okay. Good. So stratified, the sample is made up of parts of the groups, right? <coughs> in fact, the little phrase for stratified is sum from all. You guys see that? Sum from all. For cluster, it's all from sum. Does that make sense? So stratified, everybody gets represented. So when would you want to use stratified? When you're at a college and you have an issue and you want to make sure that everybody in every level is represented. So you want to make sure you pick some freshmen, some sophomores, some juniors, some seniors. Cool? Because if you do it randomly, there's a chance you could leave the entire senior population out. And they're like, hey, what the hell? So I start from the beginning. I break it into groups and I take some from each group. That way, everybody's represented. That sounds like Congress, or at least one of the bodies of Congress, right? So what about both? What about cluster then? Cluster says where I would use cluster data would be all the hospitals in California, and then I pick some of them and ask them to send me all of their patient information. That's easier, isn't it? Instead of picking some patients from each hospital, then they have to find them, they have to send me that information. Just say, you, you've been selected, give me all your information. Do you guys see that? Yeah. Is it still random? Yes, because you could have picked any hospital. So every patient still has a chance. Yes, sir. Does cluster work when you have a way bigger population? Does it just work effectively? All of, the sam all of the methods work with a larger population. When you have a very small population and you take a sample <coughs> from it, let me say this in general. This is not going to become big until later. The closer my sample size is to my population size, it affects some of the statistical analysis that we do. Most statistical analysis is based on the sample being relative, relatively very small compared to the population. So anytime a population is very small and then taking samples from it, I might run into some trouble. Anytime, for any method. Yeah. And actually, it's not really trouble then. You're like, well, the population is small. Screw it. Take everybody. Yeah. Right? <laughs> OK. So again, you have got to follow up with reading the book to help you with this definition stuff. Um, like Josh pointed out, though, it does tend to get pretty dry. If I'm up here just spouting it at you, I'm hoping you can get through the homework. At least there, it's kind of guided to get through it. Um, we are going to get into chapter two a little bit, and then we're going to, we're probably going to head out about 10.30. How you doing? You're doing fine. For our little field trip. When you go to do your homework, do section 2.2 two and 2.3 two, at the same time. 2.3, the problems say, look back at your data from 2.2, two, what you did, now do something else. And so it so sucks when a student hands in 2.2 two, two, and then they go start to do 2.2. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so don't do that. Turn them in at the same time. Because one refers to the other. Understood? Yeah. A little hints from me to you. Um, and really what we're getting into in section in chapter two is how to represent uh, a sample. Or how to represent a group of data. And what we're working towards is to create histograms. 
And so I remember a histogram, a really rough example of a histogram would be, like here's ages of students in a classroom. Um, all right, so I would expect it to be something maybe like this, possibly. This is what I predict our uh, age thing would be looking like without giving it much thought, just throwing it up there. I mean, the most important feature of this is the fact that in this class, I expect most of you guys to show up here. Maybe I didn't even make that low enough. Some of you guys might be 17, 16, maybe you're uh, middle, I can't remember what it's called. There's students here that are in high school taking college courses sometimes. I think a few of you guys are in that book. So I might have to make that go even a little further down, but this is the idea. Notice one thing about the scale. What's true about the scale here? By how much each time? Six, 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 right? If I change the scale from bar to bar, could I trust that? That would be one way I could try to confuse people, right? Or try to skew the data. So I have to have a consistent scale here, and this scale <laughs> would be kind of like either uh, frequency, maybe 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 students. You guys with me? Now, this is, I haven't told you how to create this yet. I'm just saying this is our goal. We're going to be able to create this by the end of section 2 3. The first step before I can create this. Is, is what goes into making this bar? Why is this bar this tall? How many students were there approximately that are 18 to 24? 25. 20. Almost 25, maybe 24, right? Do you guys see that? So section 2.2 two is all about creating the table that then section 2.3 says, okay, now make the histogram based on that. So I wish they would have just made one freaking section out of it, but they didn't. So section 2.2 two is all about what's called frequency tables, frequency distributions. And I normally like to use uh, real data, but I, I don't, I'm a little ahead of where I normally am. This is kind of new for me to not really focus on chapter one a lot in class. This is nice. I'm going to actually be able to do more in this class. Um, but I don't have all your data yet from the online stuff, so I'm going to make up a list of data. And I'm going to be really nice today because one thing, the very basic thing a calculator can do for us is to sort data. So imagine having 87 data points. I want to be able to sort the damn things so I can tell the lowest, the highest, put them into all the classes, right? You guys kind of with me? So it can sort data for us. So let me give us some data that's already sorted. And let's say this is, um, oh yeah, what the hell, ages of people in class. So here we go. This is where it gets really exciting. We're just going to write a bunch of numbers down. some class somewhere. I'm going to let you guys, if you want to, write that down. Or you can just watch and then get it from the video later. All right, let me actually make sure I'm looking at that. Yep, cool. Oh, this is trying to be the number 20, by the way. So the first thing I want to ask you, how far does my histogram have to cover? From 16, 16 up to 47, right? So how, what's the range of my data? How far does my data actually range over? 47, 16. Beautiful. So it's always high minus low for that. So 47 minus 16 is? 31. 31, like. It's my quick check. 
Now let me let me take a step here and, and uh, talk about something physical. So it's always nice to have something visual. Let's say for some reason, um, let's say that this is at the this is at the 16 mark. Like there's some uh, a running measure up here. You guys with me? So this is at 16 and this is at 47. And I want to cover this with these rectangles of wood. You with me? Because of course where I'm trying to go is these rectangles here. First question is how many rectangles do we want to use? Which relates to um, classes. These are all this class, this class, this class. Cool? How are we doing so far? So the number that you can use, the number allowed, is anywhere from 5, and I'll say 10. I think the book says 12, but we're not going to have a large enough sample to really go to 12. When do you think you want to use 5 versus when do you think you want to use 10? Like, uh, is my sample actually pretty big? No. So do I want to use maybe 10 classes for that? Because you can imagine, what, what do I want the histogram to show me where people seem to be more? So if I have 20 people and I use a class, uh, 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 10 classes, it might become something like, okay, this, 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 this. That doesn't really show me anything, does it? So the bigger the sample size, the more classes, the more classes I want to use. For anybody who knows a little further math, there's actually a formula based on logarithms that we will not use. Because it really doesn't change much. It's pretty objective. Subject. Yes? The uh, bigger the population, the bigger the range of the population. The bigger the sample is. Because we're talking about all the data points <laughs> getting put into a class. So the fewer data points there are, the fewer bars you want them to have to go into. right? Otherwise, you might get to the point where each one has, there's one thing in each class. It didn't tell you anything about the distribution. So uh, let's use five classes here. Here we'll use five classes. So that relates physically to me. I want to put five boards up here. How wide does each board have to be, which relates to how wide is each rectangle have to be so that I cover the whole data set, so that I cover the whole board here. About seven years. How, what do you do mathematically? Now think about it visually here. How far do I have to go? 31. And if I'm going to use five boards, divide by five. Divide by five. Does that make physical sense? How wide does each one have to be? Well, 31 is the total divided by the five. It's going to tell me how wide they have to be. 31 divided by 5 is 6.2. So if you made each one 6, is that good enough? No. You're going to have a little bit hanging out here, and the owner of the house is going to come over and say, you can get shit for me. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> right? No payment for you. So obviously, what do I pretty much always want to do with this number if it doesn't come out? Round it up. So all number you want to round it up. So I'm going to round this up to 7. How are we doing so far? OK. All right, so now we have our what's called our class width. This is equal to the range divided by the number of classes. It's very easy to lose touch. Whenever I start writing formulas down, we lose touch with, well, that's what made physical sense. What made physical sense was how far we got to go divided by how many pieces of board I've got. It's going to be how wide each one has to be. So I call that, amazingly enough, class width. So here the class width was, on this example picture, six. And we're finding out here it has to be seven. A little bit wider for this data here. I like it. Cool, cool, cool. So now I start making my classes. So here the class width was up here, 31 divided by 5, 6.2, rounded up to 7. 
What's my first class going to start at? 16. 16, that makes sense. You don't have to start at 16, you just have to start at a number that includes this in it. So you start, could start at 15, it would be kind of silly to start at zero, because then your first few classes would have nobody in it. So it kind of makes sense to always start here, unless you can make it a whole number, and then it's a round number, 10, 20, 30. But here it doesn't really make any difference, so we'll start at 16. And here's where it gets a little bit freaky. And there's actually two ways to do this. I'm going to show you the book method first, and then I'll show you the way that I was taught. And you can do either way you want to. I don't care. <coughs> book method is a little more confusing, but it's what's in the book, so that's why I want to start there. This is not going to be 23. Because what's the next class got? What's got to go here for them to have a width of 7? What's got to go here? 17. No, careful. 16 is something. What's the next class have to start at? If it was 16 here, what's the next class have to start at to be 7 wide? 23. Now, if you put 23 here, did I put a 23 here? Yes. Where would he go? Or she? In the first or the second? I don't know. So if that's 23, what has to be this? 22. Holy shit. So that is, do you agree with me? That is confusing. But one quick thing I can say is, how many things are actually in here? 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Ah, seven. Right? It's not really the issue. We'll get to it. But you guys see how, what I always do is I put the first piece down, and then I add the class width, and then I go down by one. And that will keep me straight every time. So now you can just keep going up by sevens, right? 22, this must be 29. This must be 30 to 36. 37 to 43. You guys with me? Yeah. And then one more. 40. Uh, did I do too much there? I did too much there. You guys should have said no, no. No, I did okay there. Did That's I? Probably. Seven, 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 yeah, good. And then 44 to 40 to 50, sorry. Cool. How are we doing so far? Yeah, I like that. Half the class is completely bored. That's a bored is not bad. <laughs> bored normally means I get this stuff. Why is he stopping so much? Um, 16 to 22. This is the frequency. Can it? And 16 to 20, how, how frequently does somebody show up in that class? Well, how, what do you think to figure that out? The answer is not six. You don't subtract them. How many people are actually in there? Ten. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. How are we doing? Twenty-two. You guys see that? Yeah. Just count them. In your calculator, if you have 87 things, you'll have sorted it. It'll be easy enough to count them off, right? So there's 12 there. How many 23 to 29? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 30 to 36? 1, 2. 37 to 43? 1. 44 to 50? 1. And again, I kind of skewed it to be what I expect to happen uh, when we do ours. So what I'm going to make you guys do next week, we'll do our histogram and see what it looks like for our ages in here. Um, I might as well do the next part of this. Whole numbers are not really the best to tell what's going on. How do I tell uh, really relatively how many people are in here and how many people are in there? Not by just pure numbers, relative to everybody else. Not an average yet. Yes, otherwise known as percentage. What percentage of the people are in this class? Well, to do that, you have to know the total, right? Part divided by whole. That's a good old percentage. So how many total people did I have in the sample? 22. So the relative frequency is what it's called. It's really just another name for percentage. Because if I tell you... 8,240,000 Americans suffer from this disease. Oh, there's a lot of damn people. And then I tell you, well, that's out of 300 some odd million Americans. So I give you the percentage. And then it's like, okay, not as much as I thought. You guys kind of with me? Percentages help us out. 
besides just whole numbers gives it an idea relative. So what is 12 divided by 22? 54.5 percent. 54.5? Yeah. So if you do it, you get like 0.54, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. 6 out of 22 will be half of that, so 27 roughly. Two out of 22 will be about 9 percent. Right, I think, oh yeah, I'm just nine point something rather. One out of 22 will then be like four point something. <laughs> four and a half. What should all these percentages do at the add end? Add up to 100. Yeah, if they don't add to 100%, one of two things could be true. Either you rounded, which we almost always do, so it should be close to 100, or you left somebody out. Some poor person got left out, right? How are we doing so far? I mean, the math here is not very cumbersome or hard. Yeah? Why are we dividing everything by How do I get a percentage? So if there were 22 people in here and 12 of them are men, Beautiful. So that's all this is, is really the percentage of everybody that showed up in this class. Because okay. now, if I say 54 and a half, just over half of the people were this age, that makes a lot more sense to us than 12 people, or, you know, and there are 22 total. No, just tell me the percentage, and oh, just over half. I get that. Perfect. Yeah, I didn't know you were saying 22 people. Exactly. 22 total people. I just add up all the frequencies, and that's the total number of people. Yeah. What does it have to add up to 100 Uh, the the only reason it wouldn't, if you did everything correctly, is if you uh, rounded these. And we almost always round these, especially when we get division by something like 22, which is not going to come out perfect. So, But it, should, it shouldn't come out to 95%. If you get like 99% or 101%, that's okay. You just happen to round down or round up more. And well, if you get 96%, you're missing something. That's, that's too far off. You guys kind of with me? Okay, cool. Time to, oh, cool. So that's almost, all right, let me, let me do one last thing and then we'll head out of here. And for those of you freaking out if I'm going a little too fast, next week we'll, as a class, I'm gonna let you guys work in groups on creating your own histograms and then I can wander around and answer questions. And obviously you should definitely get into chapter two. Two, two, three homework as soon as you can. Um, let me just say a couple things about the histogram. I, I, and of course, I just erased the one that was up here. Why would I not? What would be wrong with this histogram here? There's what does it seem like is happening? Yeah, it's like either there's. Is it really that there's nobody in there? Or even worse would be, you know, here's, it's like I skipped people. That's not allowed, I can't do that. I can't have any gaps, right? There cannot be any gaps, because then it seems like either, is there nobody in that class? Or did you skip some people? You know, and then I'm not gonna trust your work. So there can be no gaps. So what's kind of wrong then? Here. Perfect. I love it. Um, the way, and of course I just remembered I have one color to choose from. The way to take care of this gap here, and of course why was this gap here in the first place? So that we didn't double count the 23 year olds or so forth, right? So it's got to be there. But it kind of sucks at the same time. My picture's not going to look right. So what we do, these are called class limits. And what's really kind of in here is class boundaries, like you said, by a half, 15 and a half to 22 and a half. Now that's the true picture. How far apart are 22 and a half and 15 and a half? How far apart is that? Seven. Seven. That's where you see your class width, right? Your class width is not on the limits, it's in the boundaries. And now where does this one start at? 22 and a half and see how those overlap now, right? So now, are you going to have gaps on your picture? No. So your picture would look like 
15.5, 22.5, and I just go by 7. All right, so go on there. Yeah, okay. Good. You do it, Jeff. Why did you pick 15.5?